All right, so if you happen to have your Bible tonight, you can, you can turn or go there to watch it on video. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to be teach, start off in Proverbs chapter 7. And uh, I wish that, uh, I wish that we could have the monitor on the, on the pulpit. And I don't expect y'all to be able to read that. Don't I? I wish we could have the monitor on the pulpit interconnected to the monitors on the screen, but we're not there. We don't have that. So people out there, are gonna, if you're watching, you're going to need to get a Bible. So the title of tonight is The Spirit of Jezebel. It's a spirit of deception, seduction, and destruction. So we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 7. Now one of the things, that we're going to start off in Proverbs 7. One of the, well, I want to get some, some things started. I want you to know that there was a literal woman named Jezebel. All right, we're going to read about her tonight. We're going to talk about her in 1 Kings chapter 18. She was a, a, an antagonist to the will of God for Israel's life. But listen, even bigger than that, there's a theme throughout the scripture. What I would say the spirit of Jezebel. And the spirit of Jezebel is that spirit, that seductress spirit that is desiring to move God's people away from the right relationship with him. And it's a spirit that seduces and deceives and brings destruction. In this first Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to start reading. This is a Proverbs of Solomon. Sadly, in Solomon's life, he got seduced by the Spirit. We won't get into all that right now, but he fell into the trap of this seductive spirit. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, you read about the life of Solomon, you realize that he married many foreign women that he wasn't supposed to, and that those women drew his heart away from God. And that he ultimately ended up building altars for the God of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And that's what I'm trying to describe. And this woman, Jezebel, it doesn't have to be a woman. Yes, it can be a woman because that's a, not, that's a perfect illustration. It can be a woman that comes in and she's the antagonist to the bride. She's the antagonist to the bride throughout scripture. And she wants to come in and she wants to seduce. And she wants to steal the heart away from God. And she wants to deceive and she wants to bring God's people away from the will of God. Amen. And ultimately, I probably have it somewhere written in my notes before it's over with. What you need to understand is her desire is to prevent the marriage. And what I'm trying to say is, is that the people of God, as we move forward and get closer to the end, the, what God's word talks about is the marriage supper of the lamb. Meaning God's bride is going to marry the lamb. You know that, right? You've heard that before. So in this Proverbs chapter 7, Solomon writes this, and, and he's describing something that he, whether he really visualized it from his house through the window, I'm not positive. But this is the way, like in other words, he says he did. But was it something where he just saw some young man and he knew there was a prostitute down the road? And, and, and so God moved on his spirit to write this spiritually. I believe there's a lot of allegory in this proverb. But we're just going to read it at face value. But we're going to connect a lot of concepts biblically. Okay, you ready? So here Solomon goes. He said, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of your eye. Now, the apple of the eye, the idea, if I click on that right now, it would be pupil. So what do you do? Have you ever been working in the woods and you're cutting branches down and all of a sudden they got branches flying? You ever you got almost hit by a branch right there on your eye and your eye, thank God, your eyelid reflexively closes and prevents a major danger, a major injury from taking place. The word of the Lord right here, he's saying, let my law, which is the word of God, be like like the apple of your eye. It's so important that you want to protect it because if this thing gets injured, you're not going to be able to see it. Spiritually speaking, oh, yeah. you're not going to be able to see yeah. the will and the word of God if you don't protect That's this good. aspect. Come Amen? Yeah. It says, bind them upon your fingers, write them upon the table of your heart. Say unto wisdom. Now, I want you to know, know this also. So, the, the Jezebel spirit is in opposition and an antagonist to the bride of Christ. She's trying to steal the love, right? But in addition to that, in this proverb, this spirit, this woman, this adulterous woman that we're going to talk about, she's in competition with another woman that Proverbs talks about. Her name is Wisdom. She's the wisdom of God. Say unto wisdom, you're my sister. 
Call understanding your kinswoman. The, the idea behind this is a relative. Wisdom, and I've taught this many a time, and just for brevity, wisdom has to start with knowledge. If you don't learn the knowledge of God, you cannot begin to apply the knowledge of God in real life situations. Once the knowledge of God is applied, it becomes wisdom. Once a person begins to apply wisdom in their lives, then with time they begin to gain understanding. Understanding for a person is when they can begin to understand the world they live in from the perspective of the way God sees the world that you are living in. It's a, it's a deeper level of understanding God. Does that make sense? Yeah. But not everybody takes the time to learn the Word of God. And we're all at different levels of our walk with God. But that's why we have to put time in to learn the Word of God. Because if you're like me, you believe that God is real. Yes. I hope you like that. <laughs> if you're like me and you believe that God is real, and I'm not talking about just any God, I'm talking about the one that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to set you free from the yes. power of sin. And if you're like me, you believe that God literally wrote the word of God to communicate to mankind so that they would know his will and they would know who he is. That's right. And that he wants to he wants to reveal himself through the word of God. And, and, and so that's why we study these things. So wisdom is like a relative to you. Now I don't know how your family has treated you before. Lord knows, right? <laughs> wisdom and understanding are illustrated as family members. Even though sometimes I get irritated with my family, I love my family and I don't want harm to come to my family. I want to I wanna make sure that they're okay. Does that make sense? Jesus is the word of God made flesh. The word here is wisdom. The word is understanding. I hope that makes sense to you. The word of God says in John 1.14 that the, that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The concept of family is that we love our family. We want them to be okay. Whereas the strange woman. See, she's, she's different than. If you, look at, if you look at another version, they'll call her the forbidden woman. But she's a stranger. She's not a relative, not at least to the people of God. And the strange woman is different. She's the seductor. She wants God's people hurt. She wants God's people destroyed. What we're going to see in the proverb when it's all said and done, and we just got to hustle up because this proverb is only the beginning. But what we're going to see is that this seductor, she has a plan, but the man doesn't know where he's going to end up till he gets to the end of the path. See, the whole time he's over there, he's whistling, and he's being seduced, and he's like, oh, his heart's fluttering, and he's feeling real good about what he's about to do. It's so exciting. It's so passionate. Oh, man, sin, the first time you taste it, it tastes so good, it's delectable, but then it stings in the end. It bites like an adder, like a snake, like a viper, and it goes from looking good, smelling good, and feeling good to becoming a poisonous destruction. Yeah. That begins to create all kinds of havoc in life. That's good. Wisdom and understanding are the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. Hebrews chapter 2 says that he became us. He's, our, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And because he's not ashamed to call us brethren, he became us. Just as the children, you and I were flesh and blood. He became flesh and blood. So that he could destroy the power of him who had the power of death, which is the devil. So... That they may keep you, what? Wisdom and understanding from the strange woman. From the stranger which flatters with her words. <clears throat> now, I want to just digress for a moment here. And I want to talk a little bit about these words, these flattery words. I want to bring you to a couple of spots in the scripture. And I want to, I want to show you a theme that's running through the courts like a thread that weaves the word of God together. There's many things that do that. Where they weave the word of God together. This concept of this Jezebel spirit, that's one of them. But in addition to that, these flattery, smooth words that sound silky, and they, but they grow and they, they start off as, as like you can't even really see that as deception. But boy, when it becomes full circle, it's a mess. It grows and it gets powerful. So... The, the deceitful words, the adulterous woman is a common theme, like I said, and her ways are personified in this proverb. What does the word personified mean? It means when words or concepts take on human characteristics. So God wants to describe to us the spirit of seduction, and he's gonna, we're going to about to get into this woman a little bit more. But in this proverb, the, it describes the life of Jezebel, and it describes the harlot of Revelation 17, and we'll end with that. But look, her words flatter. 
if you look it up in the original language, the idea is the words are smooth. They flow like oil. They're soft. They sound right, but these words are deceit and result in division and separation. In the garden, the serpent's words were subtle and crafty. Let's look at that right here. Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, see, he used the words to the woman. He said unto the woman, yes, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. See, I want you to get the picture of a snake. Have you ever, have you ever even been walking somewhere and you didn't realize that there was a snake hidden somewhere? Snakes are really slippery. They're real slippery. You got to watch out in Louisiana, man. Now, I mean, I'll be hiding behind a rock somewhere. They'll hide in the grass. You might see the grass moving. You don't really know what's down there. A snake is slippery. And, and, and sometimes it's too late. You don't realize it's there. And boom, you get hit. You get bit. I'm talking about these smooth, flattery words right now. This is the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to, virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We're going to come back to this a little bit later, but right now I just want you to see this idea that in the garden, the serpent was more subtle. He was slick. In the, in, in the French people down the road in Pierre Park, where my sister married some guy down there, my, they, they would call that canai. He's canai. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's slick. He's deceitful. So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs 7. She flatters with her words. Her words are smooth. For at the window of my house, here we go, we're getting into it. I looked through the casement and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man. This young man was void of understanding. So you gotta understand something. Listen, in this world that we live in, there's people that understand some of the things of God. There's people that don't understand anything about the things of God. And then there's some people that understand a whole lot about the things of God. But what he's trying to say right now is, is that this young man I saw outside the window of my house, he didn't have any understanding about God. And this is what he did. He was passing through the street near her house. I found this note that I put in my, in my phone back in 2014. And this is what I wrote. Who is her? She is that spirit of Antichrist, mystery, Babylon, false doctrine, and mother of harlots. Who, her, her who disguises herself as religion while plunging a knife into the livers of men. Because that's what we're going to see at the end of this proverb. That's what she's doing. She's piercing people through into their, it's called a liver shot. They, that's what they, they, you can hear them whenever you're talking about boxing. All of a sudden it's like, boom, he hit him in his belly. And then the dude drops. And now he's not the same for the rest of the fight. Every time they hit him in his, it's just a little body shot. What's the big deal? He caught his liver. He's done, dude. Every time he hits him right there, now he's just going to keep on following, keep on following, keep on following. Until he finally says, I don't want no more. And that's what the idea here is. The enemy of your soul through this seductress woman wants to put a liver shot on you and bring you to the point where you don't get up. He wants to do that to every last one of us in this place. He wants to do it to our children and our offspring. That's right. But this man that's void of understanding, he's passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black, and the dark night. You see how that just gets worse? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, you see how it gets darker? It starts off in the evening. Next thing you know, it's in the black. It's in the evening. It's in the black. It's in the dark of night. And, and the dark progressively gets darker. The darker the night, the harder to see. The greater the <coughs> sin, the harder to discern. <coughs> Jesus is the light of the world. You and I, he's transferred that light to us for the light of the world. But when we, when we engage sin, when we begin to become seduced, we're filled with more and more darkness and it becomes harder for us to see. But look what who's waiting for him. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot. In biblical allegory, the harlot is the opposite of the bride. She's the seductress that plans to destroy the marriage. In the context of where God's people are going, she's trying to prevent the final marriage to the Lamb which is the church, 
which is you, the, the, the lamb, the marriage of the bride to the lamb. You're the bride. I'm the bride. Amen. This seductress, this, this spirit of harlotry. And listen, she represents not just false religion. Yeah, she's the mother of harlots, and that has to do with false religion. It's anything that she can put on you. It's like any kind of spell that she can put on you to move you away from the truth of God into a lie. It can be packaged in anything. Come up with some stuff in your head, whatever the things that you struggle with, because I'm sure we all struggle with something. Whatever you just see that little package and you can see the name on top of it, that is something that she's trying to use to seduce. Right, right. She's, she's got the attire of a harlot and she's subtle of heart. Now, this guy, sub, this, this word subtle, it had, if it's used in a good context, it, it describes protection. But when it's used in a negative context, it's, it has the idea of a siege behind it. You know what a siege is? It's whenever somebody captures. It's something hidden. So she, the way she acts is subtle. She's got something subtle on the inside. You don't see sin for what it really is until this viper bites you. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Like, it, it doesn't, oh, I don't see all that bad. Come on, man. What's your, what's your problem, preacher? It's not that big of a deal. It's a little bit <coughs> right. Well, then, but, but guess what? When, when By the time it's done, it's all blown up and it's huge. Yeah. And that's what the enemy does. He, it's kind of like the Trojan horse. I remember the story of that, of that, that Greek missile. Well, I mean, it was a real story. It's what we understand. The Trojan horse. Well, I, I don't remember exactly who was fighting who. But, not, but, but, they, but they sent in the horse and acted like it was a gift. For the city. Y'all remember that? He put it in inside the wall city because they couldn't penetrate from the outside. It was this huge wooden horse that they built. And in the nighttime, they had all their warriors in it. In the nighttime, the warriors snuck out of the Trojan horse and they ransacked the city. And that's and they and they defeated the city. They couldn't, couldn't get in from the outside. See, when you're in Christ. And you're trusting in the Lord and you're believing in the word of God and in the gospel. The enemy can't get, can't get at you. But what he does is, is that he tries to sneak it in. And that looked like it's as bad as what, what you thought it was. But then the next thing you know, it blows up on the inside of the city. And it starts to bring about trouble. This is what she is. She's stubborn. She's loud. Her feet do not abide in the house. She's without and out of the street. She lies and wait at every corner. Now, real quick, I want you to see. We're going to contrast her. To this proverb, to this woman in Proverbs. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding put forth her voice? She stands in the top of the high places, by the way of the places, by the paths. She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city. At the coming in at the doors. You see where she's doing? She's positioning herself where people are going to come by. In other words, what this is trying to say is, is that the gospel, God is proclaiming the gospel. We used to talk about this a lot. God has a transmitter and he's transmitting the gospel. That's what wisdom is. She is the voice of God. And she's proclaiming the gospel and it's being transmitted <coughs> abroad, but not everybody has to receive her. Right. She's out there screaming in the streets. Now, the harlot woman is subtle apart and she's hiding behind the corner, but she's over there. Psst, psst. Yeah, that's good. Psst, psst. Come over here. I heard it. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard it's how Filipino women are to the Marines in the Philippines. Psst, here. Like it's all sneaky and they're trying to, it's a seductive, seductive kind of thing. And, and, and what we're seeing here is the contrast between the woman of the woman of seduction and wisdom that is crying out loud where everybody can see. So this is where she is. She's in the street. She lies and wait at every corner. So look what she did. She caught him. And she kissed him. And I gotta tell you, a kiss don't seem all that big of a deal. Anytime that you hear me talking to somebody, whether it be young people, I'll tell an older person this. You can think I'm crazy if you want to. This whole thing starts off with seductive words. Emotionally, it starts off with seductive words, but then the next thing you know, she kisses him. And if you think a kiss isn't that bad, but really and truly, it's a transference of passion. And I'm telling you right now, it starts with a kiss, but it's not going to end with a kiss. Yeah. It's going to turn into something bigger. And listen, speaking physically, when you, when you, it's one thing whenever you're married to somebody, somebody like, man, come on, man, I'm an adult, man. Who are, you, who are you talking to? You can do whatever you want. But if you're trying to hear from the voice of God 
And you go around kissing people in a passionate way. I'm telling you right now, you might have invited something in that, that you may not be able to hear as clearly as what you thought you were. Right, right. I believe that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to back off of that. I believe it. Amen. It, this is, look what she says now. This is the craziest thing. She says, I have peace offerings with me. Mm. This day I have paid my vow. What are you talking about? She's, got, she's cloaked in religion, my friend. She got a code of religion on and she's saying, but look, I'm going through the motions and I'm doing everything right. Then she says, therefore came I to meet you diligently. You know, listen, the children of God are supposed to diligently seek the face of God. But at the same time, I need you to know that the spirit of Jezebel is diligently seeking the people of God to seduce them and pull them away from the will of God. She's diligent, come to diligently seek you. And look, I have found you. Now, look at this. She says, I decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved work, with fine linen. I want you to notice, she says, I decked my bed with coverings of tapestry. It's a beautiful looking bed. Yeah. Visually, it's pleasing to the eyes. Look, she says, I put fine linen, the fine linen of Egypt. You know what's weird? Check this out. I was just, I walked past the door, and Miss Angela's TV was playing. I'm just now, it's just now hitting me. And the dude that made the, my pillow, mm -hmm. what's Mike, his name? Mike Lindell. Mike Lindell was advertising his sheets mm -hmm. that he makes out of cotton that is harvested from near the Nile Delta River in Egypt. Oh, that's the best cotton on the earth. Best cotton in the earth. It is. There it is, right there in the Bible, my friend. I have yes. bedded my bed with the finest linen that Egypt has to offer. This is 600 pound stuff here, buddy, or even better. Yes, we <coughs> So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that whenever the seductress comes and she's selling sin, it looks good to the naked eye, and it feels good to the tactile sensation. She says, I perfume my bed. Oh, it even smells good. But look at this. It's got a little hint of myrrh in it. Just a little hint, just a little pinch of myrrh that's hidden by the aloes and the cinnamon. And myrrh they use to embalm dead bodies. The, 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 the death is in there. You just can't sniff it out because it's so well hidden. It's, it's such willingness to seduce that you don't catch on. Look what she says. Come and let us take our fill of love until the morning. She said, you know, if you look up that word fill, it means to bathe oneself, to be drunk with it. Basically, just want to just swim in this stuff. It just feels so good. It smells so good. It looks so beautiful. Let's swim in this and let's get as much of it as we can until the morning comes. See, everything's done in the night. It's all done in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, Paul says those in darkness get drunk in the night. They sleep in the night. Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes in the night. Some of the virgins had light for the night. Other virgins ran out of oil, so they didn't have light for the night. And, 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 and then whenever they woke up, it was, it was over with. They, they, the, the, the five were gone, and we're going to knock on the door. No, it's too late. It came in the night. And then we're prepared for the night. The seducer wants people blind until the end, whereas Jesus heals the blind so they can see the works of God. You can't see in the night without a light. You got to have the light. Your, lamp, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my past. The Holy Spirit is the oil that keeps the word of the lamp burning on the inside. We need the Holy Spirit to give us understanding and revelation of the word yes. so that we don't get caught in the dark. So that we don't get lost in the night. Yeah, that's good. She says, until the morning, let us solace ourselves with love. Look at this. Oh, this is this is this is just crazy. She says, for the good man is not at home. He's going on a long, long journey. She's a cheater and entices others to cheat on God. The good man is the man of the house. In this sense, the whole concept here is spiritual this spiritual deception or seduction and enticement to get one to cheat on God. The more a person slips into sin, the darker the night, the further away on the journey it seems that God is going. Look, this is another parable in Matthew 25. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. He gives his talents, he entrusts to his servants his land, and he asks them 
to care for the land until he returns. That's a parable about Jesus going away to the Father's house, but he says, I'm coming back again and I'm going to settle accounts. And in this pro proverb, in this parable story, she said, the good man's going on a long journey. He brought a pocket full of money and he ain't coming back for a long time. Woo-hoo, let's fill ourselves with love. He won't be here for quite some time. He's taking a bag of money with him. He will come home on the appointed day. Look, with her much fair speech. You know what, when you look that word up in the Hebrew right there, the idea is doctrine, learning, and teaching. She taught this man. She taught this man a false way. He gave an ear to hear, and in the end, it led to destruction. She caused him to yield. I wish I had time to preach tonight. Don't yield your members as servants of unrighteousness, right. Romans chapter right. 6, verse 23. Right. Don't yield to sin. Right. But through false doctrine, through false teaching, through lies and seduction, she caused him to yield. Mm. Let's not, again, no, just make it your package. Whatever the package is with the name on there. Sex, drugs, rock, rock and roll. That was an interesting <laughs> thing. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Lust, whatever your package is with that name, that's what the enemy wants to use. That's what the spirit of seduction wants to use to pull you away. That's the Trojan horse. Sometimes it is. It's so subtle that it's false doctrine in a church that looks right, but it ain't. It's not bought into the truth of the gospel. And if you're not, if you're not learning, if we're not learning how to wield our sword properly and understanding the word of God, we too could get caught up in the Trojan horse. Amen. Yeah. With, with the flattering of her lips, she forced him to go. He goes after her straightway as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Look at this. Till a dart strikes through his liver. As a bird is hastened or caught in a snare. And he knows not that it, this is for his life. Wow. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart decline to her ways. Go not astray into her path to be seduced. Right here, this word astray means to be seduced, to stagger out of the way, to be deceived. And that's what we've been emphasizing already. This woman we just read about is a seductress. She is the spirit of Antichrist. Her purpose is to deceive God's people and lead them away from God. She employed certain techniques. Her words flattered and were smooth. She concealed her seduction with religion. What she offered appealed to the senses. It looked good. It smelled good. It felt good. Don't go to her paths. Yes, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Now, I want to transition real quick. I want to tra transition real quick to the literal Jezebel. And so, real quick, I want I, I turn with you. This is First Kings chapter eighteen, verse nineteen. And I want to remind you. So, let's real quick. Let, let's just actually look at, at a couple of maps real quick. You ready? Here we go. Here's one map. I wish that I could, I wish that I could draw on these maps. I don't think it works, though. I don't understand why it doesn't let me be interacting with a little Apple pencil. But it does. <coughs> oh, look at that. It works. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe some work, maps work, some don't. The reason I circled that place right there is that place is called Sidon. See, we've been laying a foundation. I know that I used so many words, I probably lost you since the last time. But... What did we say about Sidon? You may not remember, but Jezebel's daddy was the king of Sidon. He was a Phoenician king. We talked about the fact that this whole area was filled with occultic activity. Now, here's another little place right there that I want to circle for you. That's Mount Carmel. Where the story that we're about to read, where Elijah has a showdown with the prophets of Baal, took place right there on that mountain near the Mediterranean Sea. All right? So, there we go. Here's... That was uh, one. That was one map, and here's the other map, Mount Carmel right here. See it, Mount Carmel. That's where the where Elijah had this showdown with the prophets of Baal. Now, so I want you, I want you to see that in this story we're about to read, and we're going to go through it relatively quickly, 
But the main thing that I'm trying to point out to you is this woman Jezebel. Let's see what this really said. This is what this is what Elijah says. Therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. I don't, he didn't say blow the trumpet, but that's how they would do it back in the day. They would blow the trumpet. <laughs> Let the people know that we gotta con we gotta congregate we gotta, gotta congregate. Because something's about to go down. Yeah, yeah. We're about to have a showdown with false religion on the Mount on Mount Carmel. It's about to go down. And he says, Give me all Israel to Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now, I want you to, mention, I want you to imagine this. Jezebel is a son of a Sidonian king, full of occultic activity. One of the people that we talked about last week was the Syrophoenician's daughter, and that she was demon possessed. Syrophoenicia is the area that Jezebel, I mean, yeah, it was thousands of years later, but it's the neighborhood Jezebel came from. People are bound up and they're being they're being demon possessed because it's all occultic activity. You got to see this. This is the context of the Bible. Your Bible is written in this context. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just studying. The word groves right there is kind of gross. Gross sounds kind of like groves. It's actually a male phallus. That was the sign. It was an Asherah pole. It was the female cult deity that was interconnected to Baal. And so, listen, the children of Israel are worshiping this. Ahab, the leader of Israel, has married himself to the seductress woman Jezebel, and she has brought her false religion into the church, if I could say it that way. And she's bringing all kind of idolatry in, and the people of God are worshiping it as though they're worshiping God. It says, I want you to bring all of them that eat at Jezebel's Take. Now, I want to break some things down spiritually speaking for just a second. I want to say this, that Elijah is a type of the believer. He provides God a vessel. This is bigger than just a one prophet. There's a lot of symbolism in the life of Elijah. And before it's over, we're, we're going to break that down a little bit. Elijah is a type of the believer, provides God with a vessel through which he combats the spiritual seduction of Jezebel. Let me say that again. Elijah is a vessel... That God uses to combat the spirit of Jezebel. So Jezebel is a type of the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Elijah is a type of how God moves and combats. He's looking for somebody that he can find that will speak the truth. He's looking for somebody that he can find. And, and, and throughout the years of God's salvation history, he's found many in Elijah that would allow their vessel to be used and filled up with the Holy Spirit. Listen, we're going to look at some scriptures in Malachi before we're done. We're going to talk about before that great and terrible day of the Lord, the Lord's going to send Elijah back. The, the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of the Holy Ghost moving and operating through the body of Christ. The one that will speak the truth to combat the spirit of Antichrist that is causing deception and disobedience upon the face of the earth. Elijah is like a believer that holds onto the woman of wisdom. He becomes a vessel that God can use to combat the works of the seductress. You know what Jezebel's name means? It means unchaste. It means she's not virtuous. She's not pure. It's the characteristic of, that's what her name means, Jezebel. Unchaste. You can't make this stuff up. It suggests transgression or excess. This is the description of a harlot, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of harlotry, spiritual spirit of deception that causes one to cheat on God. And let's not forget again that she, her daddy, was a king of this occultic area. So Ahab sent all the children of Israel gather, gather the prophets to Mount Carmel, and Elijah, Elijah came unto all the people and said, "How long will you halt between two opinions?" You know that word halt, literally, if you look it up in another, I'm pretty sure if I, if I show you the, the ESV real quick, look at this. How long will you go limping? <laughs> How long will you limp? How long are you going to halt? Oh, Baal is God. No. Yahweh is God. Baal is God. See, Elijah's over here calling them out because i got to be honest with you. I've read many of scholarly books that actually describe the fact that at this time frame of Israel, they didn't even know the difference. 
They didn't even know the difference they, because the word Baal means Lord. They were calling Baal Lord and calling Lord Baal, and it was all intermixed. It gets, it gets very confusing after a while. How long will you go back and forth between the two? Elijah's saying, you're not serving God right now. You think you're serving God. I'm not talking to you. I'm just telling you where the church is. You, you think you're serving God, but you're not even really serving God. He says, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. <laughs> Then said Elijah to the people, I even only I remain a prophet of the Lord. That's not true, but sometimes it feels that way. There was, he, he was actually the leader of a school of prophets. Right. There, was, there was another prophet. He was in prison, though. <laughs> said, but his name was Micaiah. We talked about him last time. He was the only one, he would, oh, was the only one that would tell Ahab the truth, so Ahab hated him. Let them therefore give us two bullets. And so listen, real quick, I'm going to save a little time. He said, listen, you're going to get two bullets, I'm going to get two bullets, we're going to flame them, we're going to cut them up, we're going to put them on the altar, and we're going to pray. You pray to your God, I'm going to pray to my God, and the God that answers by fire, that's the one we're going to know, is the one true God. <laughs> and all the people said this, all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. That sounds good, Elijah. Good. You know what we're going to do? We're going to get us a sign. That sounds good. We want a sign from the Lord to know which way. Why do we need a sign? I, I just, I'm just asking a question. Why do we need a sign, Israel? You, you serve in the same God that called your father Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and created a nation. And he revealed himself to you in Egypt when you were a slave. And he delivered you out on a stone dry ground. Why do we need a sign? Because you're confused, because you've been seduced, because you've been worshiping false gods, and you don't have spiritual discernment anymore to be able to see clearly what's really going on here. It's good. I want you to see this, Matthew 6, 16, 4. This is what Jesus said, I didn't make this up. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them in the park. What kind of sign are you going to give us? Jesus, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to get buried in the tomb. Just like Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. That's the sign you're going to get. I'm going to die on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. They're going to bury me in the tomb. And I'm going to resurrect on Thursday. That's the yes. sign. Yes. Glory. Everybody's seeking after a sign. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. We'll get into this in even more in detail as we move forward. Even him who's coming is talking about Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Revelation 13, 13. And he does great wonders. Who's this? This is the false prophet that's working with the Antichrist. He does great wonders so that he wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven. The same miracle that Elijah is asking the Lord to do. So will the false prophet working with the Antichrist in the end days. He will also cause fire to come on the earth. And why is that? And to deceive them that dwell on the earth. Because if you go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, you realize that the reason that God even allowed all of this to happen was because of the fact that, they, that mankind wanted to believe a lie. Many times people don't want to hear the truth. Many times people want to believe that where they are is okay. They don't want somebody to tell them the truth. I don't know about you, but I've been in church services. I've been whenever people are preaching the truth and they're, and they're kind of hitting on my stuff. And I don't like it, my friend. It's kind of like they got some, they're poking me in my ribs and it's real uncomfortable. It's like a thorn in my side. I'm just like, man, we just got to shut up. Would this girl just shut up and she just quit preaching on this? Well, don't, you, don't we realize that that's the flesh? Don't we realize that's, that's, that's demonic activity trying to frustrate us? When somebody's telling us the truth of the gospel, by the grace of God, we should be embracing it. So the people said, that was well spoken. Now I want you to see this. He says, they start praying. These uh, false prophets. They said, oh, Baal, won't you hear us? 
but there was no voice. And it came to pass at noon, and listen, at some point in time, they, they got up on the altar. I'm trying to look for the spot. They get up on the altar, and look, look what it, he, it says that they, they, look, they cried aloud and they started cutting themselves. After their manner with knives and lances, till the blood gushed out upon them. Let's read that a little bit more slowly. They cried aloud and they cut themselves after their manner. That means that this is something that they did. So whenever they would call on demon spirits, there was a lot of things that they would do. They would get into some really, real se really weird sexual practices. But in addition to that, they would cut themselves. And then we see the man of gathering that we talked about, and he lived in the midst of the tombs, and he would cut himself. Now, I, I do want to say this because I'm going to do that teaching tomorrow night to try to clarify a question. Oh, that's going to be on Facebook at 7 o'clock. You can tune in if you want to. You don't have to. Comfort in your home. But one of the things that I want to make a point is, is that when I was studying to write that book, I learned something that was very powerful that I had never really realized before. There's a big difference between, a, I'm calling it this, this is the word I, I think I made it up. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to A controlled possession versus an erotic possession. What I'm trying to say is, is this, is that, I believe from the things that I have learned about the occult world that people that make a league with Satan and they willingly allow demonic spirits to use them as a vessel just as you and I allow the Holy Spirit to use us as a vessel, the enemy doesn't allow, they're not going around acting like Linda Blair twisting their head and puking split pea soup all over the place, at least not right then and there whenever the enemy's willing to use them. They're under controlled possession. They're being led by the forces of evil in order to accomplish a greater purpose. Yep. But then whenever the enemy's done with them, they end up being just as messed up as everybody else, if not worse. <coughs> but, in, but in addition to that, sometimes I call some people are like collateral damage. That would be like the man of God. We don't know his complete story. We don't know how he ended up the way that he was. But a lot of times people are used in occult rituals. It's very demonic stuff. And, and what I mean is they're used as victims. Right. And it's a whole lot different than a person that's doing the, the, the weird stuff. They're, they're the ones that are being led by the enemy to do the weird stuff. I hope that makes some sense. But listen, this, this has transpired into modern day life that we live. You do understand that. Whenever young, whenever young people start to cut themselves... If you question them on it, they will tell you that by doing that, it relieves pressure. It relieves stress. They feel better momentarily right, right. when they do that. This bloodletting concept, they, they feel better momentarily. Now, you try to have a conversation with psychological professionals on this, and I'm like, but, but why is this in here? Why do we have an Old Testament scenario and a New Testament scenario and why do we have video of Marilyn Manson tearing tearing pages of the Bible out on stage and also cutting himself and screaming at the video well putting his explicit lyrics up there and says if you don't raise your children I'll raise them for you and writes a song and in the midst of my teenage fit I cut my my little wrist or whatever mm. point being is, is this is that Demonic activity continues to so we're seeing this. This is demonic activity. They're calling on their God. Now, this is just kind of funny, real quick. I know I gotta hustle up a little bit. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked it. He said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Talking about their crying out the veil. Either he is talking or he is pursuing. Now, that King James word right here, pursuing, is kind of hiding from you what's really being said. If you look it up in the original Hebrew, it said like evacuating the dross. <laughs> in other words, he's in the outhouse. Where's your God? Oh, he's in the outhouse. He's taking care of his business. And maybe that's why he's not answering. Okay? Or he's on a journey. Or he sleeps and you, you must awaken him. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice there was neither voice nor he didn't show up. And so then Elijah, look at the first thing he does. He repaired the altar. Amen? What, the first thing you do to combat the spirit of Jezebel is you preach the truth. 
The altar of God is the cross of Christ. How do you preach that truth? And why was it so confusing for the children of Israel that they would limp between two opinions? Because I told you already, after a while, they're calling Baal the Lord, and they're calling the Lord Baal, and they're confused. And what I want you to know, though, is this, is that a lot of false Christianity looks ridiculously similar to what we see going on right here. Yep. And you can, you can, I hope you don't hate me for telling you what I believe to be the truth. And I know that they're not up there cutting, but they're up there, they're up there dancing. And listen, let's dance for the Lord. Let's shout for the Lord. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But they're up there blowing, and they're up there like, you know, and people are falling <laughs> out, and they're falling out in waves. And then some people are falling around on the ground like dogs, and they're barking, and people are shaking, and they're jerking, and they're doing all this stuff look like they're having seizures. I'm sorry, that's not the Lord. Amen. That's right. Right. It's not the Lord. As a matter of fact, you can do some research that has to do with what's called uh, Kundalini Yoga and the Kundalini Kriyas. You Google that when you get home. A guy named Andrew Strong did some studying on that. And the same manifestations that had happened at some of these revivals that took place on the East Coast and up north in Canada, the people were jerking and they were doing these yep. very things. And people that have engaged in kundalini yoga, which is not the same God we serve, they also show these same types of manifestations. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that just as the children of Israel were under the seduction of Jezebel back in the day, I believe that much of many things that go on in the modern church are also under a seduction, and it is not the same Jesus that's being preached. All right. He reminds me, look what he does, he gets 12 stones. I think this is important. I know I'm giving you a lot. This is actually a lot of meat. If you don't like, if you don't like meat, it kind of... You get tired of chewing after you get the big old steak after you've been chewing on it for a while. But look, what does it mean when Elijah took 12 stones? This is like 500 years after they crossed the Jordan. Y'all remember the story? Y'all remember the story when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan? The, the waters of Jordan parted just like the waters of the Red Sea. What did God tell Moses? Put 12 stones down there. Why? As a memorial. So Elijah goes and he finds 12 stones to build his altar because he's trying to remind the people of where they come from. Don't you remember your past? How are you going to know how to move forward in the ways of God if you don't know where you came from? The modern church is looking for something new every time we turn around the corner. But the word God we serve, he's the ancient of days. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not changing. He's already changing. Oh, God's going to do a new thing. God already did a new thing. God sent Jesus to die on the cross. The next new thing, hallelujah, is that we're going to see him in glory. Hallelujah. 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 He goes on to say this. The Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. God changes people. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so he pours water on the sacrifice. Look, look what he calls out. Y'all love praying this way sometimes. And when I feel the Lord behind it. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Dude, yes. when I'm praying, sometimes I'm by myself. I feel that. <laughs> I'm yeah. telling you right now, he's the ancient of death. Amen. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, sir. He is the same yesterday, today, and today. That's right. He says, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that, that I have done all these things at your word. We're about to get into some stuff. I think we're about to start moving a little bit faster, but I'm trying to lay a foundation for you. That Elijah is a, being used as a vessel by God to speak the truth. And he's saying, listen, I have done all these things according to your word. You're the one that told me to call the prophets of Baal to show up on Mount Carmel. You're the one that told me to call out this false situation that's going on. I'm asking you to show up and to prove yourself, Lord. <clears throat> Hear me, O oh Lord, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back again. See, I want you to know something. Whenever we're talking about the spirit of Elijah, the Lord's going to send him forward when we get near the end days. I believe that the spirit of Elijah is the Holy Spirit working through God's people that's drawing people back. People that will be, that are going to preach the truth. People that are telling the truth of the gospel so that people can realize that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's not okay with people living a life of compromise. That's right. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and <coughs> licked up the water.
that was in the trench. And look at this. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is yes, the God. Yes. Now look what Elijah said. Now, this is what, now take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down through the brook Kishon and slew wow. them there. Mm -hmm. Back in the Old Testament, that's one reason we don't see a lot of divine possession. Because all these guys, like people being cast out, we see a lot of divine possession. These guys were demon possessed, and they were manifesting or trying to manifest or to show the enemy's power. But God didn't let Baal show up that day. And a big reason that we don't see a lot, and we'll get into it a little bit more tomorrow night. But one of the big reasons is because God's working through Israel nationally. And, and a lot of times, these people, the, 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 Lord's, the Lord's killing them. The Lord's telling his people, kill them. Get them out. Rid the land of this. I hope that that makes sense to you. People that have, people that, and we're not supposed to go killing people today. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. But, but that's, that's how serious this is. If you and I play with d d demonic stuff, if you and I play with the forces of evil, it can turn into a big mess. Amen? That's right. It'll, it'll harm the people of God. Now, I want you to see this real quick. <coughs> this is, this is in, in, in chapter 19, same, 1 Kings 19. And look at this. Ahab, Ahab is running back home, and he's going to tell on the life. <laughs> Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah did. He ran all the way back to the house. He literally ran. If you read the rest of the story, that was, just, that was when him and Elijah and Ahab got in the race. Ahab was on the, in the chariot. Elijah was on the ground. And he ran. All that Elijah had done, it was all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword of Jezebel. She sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Look at this. Out the window, baby. Look at this. And when he saw that, he arose and he went for his life. Let's look at the ESV. Then he was afraid. The ESV. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life. So that's kind of an amazing thing if you think about it. That just now, yeah. Elijah had a, had a showdown with the prophets of Baal. God showed up. Yes, he did. Gave a, a wonderful victory. But then now we see the spirit of fear. Now what I want you to know is, is this. Before we start picking on Elijah, Come on. let's realize that man just faced 450 of the prophets of Baal, 400 of the prophets of the groves, and he, and he called upon the Lord. Amen. So this, this, there's right. something spiritual going on here. Right. The spirit of Jezebel will try to strike fear in the hearts of God's people. And I believe that there's a message that's going on here that's important for us to grab hold of. Now let's look at a couple of scriptures real quick to try to describe a little bit what I'm trying to explain regarding the spirit of Elijah. Actually, let's look right here. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. This is Malachi. This is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Malachi is the last prophet of the Old Testament. God speaks through Malachi, and he says, Listen, I'm going to send my messenger, and he's going to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. So we learn later on, we don't really have time to go to all the scriptures tonight, but we learn later on that Jesus says that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of this. All right, now let's, let's look into it a little bit more real quick. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. So <coughs> what, what Jesus was saying, what we learn from what Jesus says is, is that John the Baptist was a fulfillment of a type of Elijah that came before Jesus showed up and prepared the way for Jesus to come. As he preached that message of repentance, people's hearts were prepared and softened to receive Jesus. But look what he said. That was the first time Jesus came. But look at this. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now again, this is about 400, about 450, 500 BC. So Jesus isn't going to show up again for about 500 years right here when this is promised. He said, he said, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's talking about in the end. That's talking about the second time that he comes back. 
So what I'm trying to get you to see with me is, as we're working through this, and I'm giving you a lot of information, but I'm trying to get you to see again the spirit of Jezebel is the spirit of Antichrist that's trying to seduce God's people. The spirit of Elijah is the is how is how God, he's just naming it that. It's the Holy Spirit, but it's how God combats that spirit of seduction. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Yeah. All right, let's look at it a little bit more, a little bit more close. Alright, let's look at this. We need to also see the concept of fear that comes from the spirit of Jezebel. Fear that fear that gets worse as we move forward in the scripture. But let's start with Matthew 11. I'm sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me see if I can find this. Matthew 14. You ready? So here we go. I want you to see, after I've gone through all of that and laid this foundation, you should be able to at least see this spiritual connection that I'm about to make. We have in this story another woman who is against the will of God. And we have another man of God, John the Baptist, who we just saw in the scriptures as a type of Elijah. That's good. Amen? And here we go. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch, we're talking about Herod, the king of Israel during the time frame of Jesus, heard of the fame of Jesus, and he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. Because, see, Herod had him killed. Herod had John the Baptist killed. And from the dead. Therefore, my, therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake. Now, would you marry a man that would make you take that name like that? <laughs> the Herods. That is actually the last name. For Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. There's some weird stuff going on. Yeah. Her, Herod's brother Philip was married to a woman named Herodias. Herod wanted her for himself, so he took her. <coughs> And then in verse 4 it says, John said unto him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Oh, really? So just like Elijah stood up in the face of the prophets of Baal and told the people of God that they weren't worshiping the right God, John the Baptist, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, told the king of Israel, it's not right for you to have her. So what did they do? They threw him in jail. See, what's going to happen whenever the seasons start to change and it's not cool in America to be a Christian anymore? Amen. Right. I'm, right. Just trying to, I'm just trying to tell you what, what I believe is might be coming around the corner. That's what it is. Yeah. What's going to happen whenever people still stand up for the truth of the written word of God and the rest of the world is like, y'all are a bunch of agitators? He says, it's not lawful for you to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But then there was a problem. Something happened one night. It was Herod's birthday. Uh-oh. It was kept. The daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Kind of like one of the belly dance of kind of thing. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her. With that. An oath was a big deal. We're not trying to teach oath right now, but that was a big deal in the Bible Promise with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask for, so this is what she did. She being before instructed of her mother, because it's the spirit of Jezebel. Yep. How dare that man tell me that I can't be in the house with Herod just because I was married to Philip. Uh-oh. That's the spirit of Jezebel. Coming against the people of God, trying to shut the mouth of the people of God, trying to shut the mouth of the prophet of God. Give me here John the Baptist's head in the morning. <coughs> That's what she wants. She wants you to cut off John the Baptist's head. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the old sakes. You know, if I can't shut him up, if I can't sew his lips shut, I'm going to cut the head off. Believe verse 11. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. What a beautiful gift to give your mother. I mean, do you see how bad people were? You can't make this stuff up, dude. That was like a bad man. You did a good job, girl. You a good girl. Insane. 
And like, I'll put this in my notes. The child of her mother. Here you go, mommy. The head of the man that dared to tell you that you couldn't sleep with whoever you wanted. Mm. Help us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, pastors now. Let's see. Let me find my spot. So let me just let me just give you just real quick. I just want to make some points here. In Matthew eleven and thirteen and fourteen, it tells us of the time before John the Baptist has his head cut off. He's sitting in prison, and and he starts to question. He hears that Jesus is doing all these works, and he starts to question: Is this really the one? Is is Jesus really the one that we were looking for. So I want you, I want you to, I want you to think about that for a second. John the Baptist is the one that was called by God to prepare the way for Jesus. He's preparing the way for Jesus. In the end, something happens to him, and he ends up in prison. And he hears on the outside that Jesus is doing great works, but he's starting to question whether or not he even got it right. Yeah. Because yeah. he never would have expected that that was going to have to do it. Yeah. How did I end up in prison? For real. And not only that, I mean, is this God's will for my life that I would end up in prison? Is this God's will for somebody's life that their head would get cut off? So whenever we think of a type of John of, of Elijah, because we're talking about Elijah. I couldn't find my little spot, so I'm just going to have to go with the moon. How, was, how did Elijah die? Elijah in the Old Testament. How did Elijah die? Y'all remember? Was it a chariot or chariot? He did not. He he did him up. Elijah did not die. That's right. Right? Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind. There's two people that the Old Testament says didn't die. He knocked his one and Elijah is the other. Now, what is that, what is that a type of? The rapture. Jesus. Type of the rapture. Right? Meaning those that are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. There we shall be with the Lord forevermore. Elijah is a type of the rapture. Now, you know what's, what's interesting, and I don't want to get too deep in this because I do need to get ready. To go. But what's interesting is, is that James 5.17 and also Luke 24, I believe it is, talk about the fact that that it was three and a half years of a drought and a famine whenever Elijah had to show down with Jezebel, <coughs> spirit of Antichrist, and then he was taken up in the chair. Now, am I saying that that's a definite mid-trip type right there? That's not what I'm saying, but it's awfully interesting. And we're going to dig into that. You're going to have so much time to hear all this stuff that I've been digging up and looking into, and we're going to just... Pull it and look at it from every side that we can. But I will tell you this. To me, that's pretty interesting. So my question is, is that if Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind three and a half years into a famine after he has a showdown with Jezebel. And then the type of Elijah, which is John the Baptist, dies be beheaded, getting his head cut off. And we begin to question, why is all these, why do we see all of this? Because then look at Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw the thrones and them that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So is this, are we seeing within the scriptures, embedded in the scriptures, I'm just asking the question, that's the first time I ever saw it, it was just recently when it all studied that, that some believers under persecution will will make will see themselves in the rapture. Listen, I don't want you to think the way you always thought about the rapture before. I'm talking about persecution and some people making it through in the midst of persecution. And some get caught up and some have had their heads cut off. Yeah. It's, just a, it's just a thought is what I'm trying to say. Alright? If you get into Revelation chapter 2, when it talks about Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2. He says to the church of Thyatira, write these things, 
says the Son of God, who has his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. He can see everything. Amen? I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works. Now, that doesn't sound like a pretty good church right there. You got ch charity, which is love. <coughs> you're serving people. You have faith. You have patience. You're trying to endure. You have works. The last to be more than the first. Not, you know, considering all that, I got a few things against you. Let me tell you about it. You suffer that woman Jezebel. Now, you 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 suffer, you put up with her. She called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed in the idols. That's talking about demonic stuff going on there. Right. Now look, in this message here, I'm asking a question. And I know you don't probably have the answer to it, but I'm just asking it's a rhetorical type question. Was there a little literal woman named Jezebel that was teaching God's people to commit fornication? Or is this more likely the same spirit of Jezebel and that this is a description of how the church is in the end? Like it was for God's people under Ahab's reign when they were worshiping Baal and calling it worshiping God. Will the church be deceived in the end? Will they be calling their practices following Jesus, but it will really be following the spirit of Jezebel? That's a good question. Yeah. I don't have the, I believe it to be true already. And I believe that there's other scriptures that prove that point. Now I'm closing. You're going to give me five more minutes, please. And then I'm going to close. <laughs> so now we're going all the way to the end. We started in the garden. We talked about the, sedu the seductive spirit. We talked about Proverbs 7, the seduction of uh, and the woman, the harlot woman. And here we see in Revelation 17, the end of the of salvation history. God bringing it all to an end. You ready? Here we go. And there came one of the seven angels that had to the seven miles and talked with me, saying, Under you come here, I will show you the judgment of the great war that sits upon many waters. That, that, what that describes is, is, is that she's had control over the people. Land masses come out of water. People live on land masses. This great harlot has sacked and controlled humanity. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And look at this. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of fornication. I want you to just stop for a second. I want you to just imagine what happens whenever people get drunk. How they cannot see properly. They can't hear properly. They stagger. They stumble. They, they're walking a crooked line. They don't know where they're going. Their perception is off. What this passage of scripture is saying is that I'm calling her the spirit of Jezebel. I'm calling it the spirit of Antichrist. I'm calling it the spirit of iniquity. I'm calling it everything that I know what the Bible has called it to call it. And in the end, God is calling her the great heart. And what she did was she caused the inhabitants of the earth to become drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, what you would say is, yeah, but I'm in the church, preacher. Yeah, but what if the church allows some of her wine into it? Yep. And then people start to get a little bit intoxicated and they can't see as well. Is that possible? <clears throat> I'm here to tell you that the word of God tells us. Did not Paul tell Timothy in the last days people would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Did he not tell us that people would be the forces of evil? Yes, he did. So he carried me away in the spirit, cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthy fornication. Upon her forehead, this is what I'm closing with. I want you to see this. Do you remember when we talked about that? The Tower of Babel? Yes. The corporate rebellion against God. That was part of the reason that we went there. That's part of the reason why we built this foundation. That mankind willingly and purposely rebelled against God. And what he did was he made, he, he, this is where all the mystery religions originated. And it's been going on for thousands of years of human history. But the majority of mankind cannot even see it. And much of the church is completely blind to it. They don't even see what's going on. He says, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It is not a heart. Right here we see she's a mother. I didn't even get into it, but you know what? A serpent is a deceiver, but it turns into a dragon in the end. It's very strong. And 
goes from just speaking deceptive words to the emotions of people and draws them in to believe a lie. She's the mother of harlots. She gives birth to harlots. Does that, did you ever see that before? She gives birth to harlots. What are you trying to say? Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnessism. It sounded real weird. It sounded weird. All these pantheisms that are false ways. She give birth anywhere. She give birth around the corner. She give birth. She give birth anywhere. She can give birth anything. She can do to seduce. She's producing all kinds of stuff, and people are buying it hook, line, and sinker. And you know, you want to be able to at least see what I'm about to say right here, and I'm going to cry. You ought to be able to see what I'm about to say. You can worship just about any God. But if you start talking about Jesus, how long ago was it? Four years ago? You couldn't even say Mary Obama. Though. I can tell you that. I mean, Obama did, you know, whatever. But we're not going to blame it all on Obama. Because Obama didn't create that. Right, right. That's, that, I'm just going to say, look, there's something against the spirit <coughs> of Christ. Right, that's right. And there is antagonistic against Jesus. You can talk about everybody else, but if you start saying that Jesus is the one right way, you're going to find yourself under persecution. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what's happening right now. That's what's being brewed up in the world that we live in. It's creating an atmosphere where you can no longer talk like that anymore. Sure. You're going to come against people's alternate lifestyles. You're going to start talking about all this other stuff about people's physiology and their anatomy, and you're going to tell people that they can't be with who they want to be with, and you're going to tell Herodias' mama that she can't be with, with Herod instead of Philip, and you're going to tell all these people, how, what, because based on what your interpretation is of the Bible, Amen. Yeah. that's not our fault. Nope. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for your word that teaches us your ways, that teaches us your will. And we pray, Lord God, that you would give us wisdom and understanding, Lord, that you would open our eyes and that we would be able to see. We just want to give you glory and honor and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.